She is on our most powerful women list. She has been for quite a few years. Um, I never knew Diane's story. And it's an amazing story. And, you know, I love to talk about how these women leaders who are on stage and in this room were not born leaders. It's a path. You have to confront obstacles and you learn lessons along the way. So, Diane, yeah. we'd like you to tell your story. So where oh, did my. it begin? <laughs> so, um, well, where did it begin? So probably the, the biggest transformation in how I became an engineer. I mean, I'm in my position at Intel because I, I took a path into engineering. Um, it wasn't, there weren't. Many, there still unfortunately aren't a lot of women in, in engineering and in technology, but it's uh, improving. How I got into engineering was um, on accident, uh, I will say. So I was at a community college. Well, I, I was, want, you to, I want oh. you to go back. So where oh. did you grow up? Oh, I grew up in Sacramento, California. Sacramento. Oh, yeah. And you have, tell, tell us about your family. Um, so, <laughs> well, so um, I guess the most... Um, uh, uh, Outstanding part of it is uh, my dad is a convicted felon, so he served um, five years in prison for armed robbery, and he was a very violent person. I guess that kind of goes hand in hand. So growing up was kind of a difficult environment, and um, my mom took the majority of the abuse, but um, it was a difficult environment. And you have it was you and one your sister? sister older, yeah. And so my dad made it clear that um, his legal obligation to us was done when we turned 18. And so when we turned 18, we were out of the house. And so my sister was Let me older. just ask yeah. you, I'm curious now, your father was in prison for five years yeah. at San Quentin during yeah. what age? Oh, uh, before I was born. So he oh, got out of prison and married my mom, Yeah, okay. and, which was her first mistake. So, um, <laughs> but she didn't know it at the time either. Um, but yeah, so he, we always laughed that he had a room with a view because I know San Quentin's in, the, in San Francisco Bay and so at least he had a room with a view. Um, but uh, yeah, anyway, so my sister um, turned 18 uh, in August after she'd graduated from high school and so she was out on her own. Unfortunately, I turned 18 in February, so I still had four months of high school left. So I was homeless the last four months of high school. And where did you sleep? Uh, a variety of places, obviously. Um, so I kind of, you know, you do the stints, the couch surfing, so girlfriends, uh, an aunt. My sister was out and had a, an apartment with some girlfriends, so I slept there a little bit. But anyway, graduated from high school, went to community college because I didn't have any money, sitting in calculus class. What was the community college? American River Community College, yeah, in Sacramento. Uh, so I have very fond memories of that because at that point, community college was free. Like literally, you just had to pay the $20 parking ticket or parking uh, permit, that was it. So I was um, in Calculus 2, because after you take Calculus 1, you take Calculus 2. After Physics, you take Physics 2. So I was just doing the, you know, what you do, where you just keep chunking through it. So I was sitting in Calculus 2, and this uh, guy who wanted to, you know, spark up a conversation, he said, um, hey, what's your major? And so I said, I'm undeclared. I don't have a major declared. And, and he said, well, you ought to be an engineer. It's the highest starting salary you can get with a four-year degree. And I was like, holy cow, I'm going to be an engineer. And I had no idea what an engineer was. <laughs> so I was like, this is great. And so I like literally left class, calculus class. I went down to the counselor's office and I said to the counselor, I'm here to declare my major um, and I'd like to be an engineer. And she said, that's great, hardware or software? And I was like, crap, he didn't say there was more than one. <laughs> And then it got all very complicated because I thought software sounds better than hard. Why would you do hard if you can do soft? And so I did, so I did software and then I couldn't get a scholarship because I wasn't hardware. So I said that was a typo. I'm actually a hardware engineer. <laughs> Just, it was all crazy. But anyway, I, it was, it's a miracle I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> so then I, I no, I was teasing. <laughs> yeah. Now and then I transferred to UC Davis and um, graduated in UC Davis as electrical engineer, joined Intel, and 31 years later, um, I'm here. And here you are. Here I am. That, sorry for that. Oh, my God. That was more than you wanted. No, that is fantastic. Um, so you joined Intel in what year? 85. 85. Yeah. And you, uh, tell us about, the, the, there were forks in the road in your career at Intel where you could have done one thing and you did something else. And what is the lesson from, what is the biggest choice you made and what is the lesson from that? Oh my goodness, there has been a lot of, uh, a lot of forks in the road. You know, um, the situation I was in, um, I was truly a minority as a woman inside of the tech industry and it was a very rough and tumble era. And, and you tried to play like the boys. And I, you? you had to play like the boys. I mean, the one thing I will, you know, 
talking to younger women, um, it doesn't help to be on the outside of the circle. You're never going to have an impact if you're on the outside. So somehow you got to get to the inside. And, and as a minority, you have to rec you have to be willing to admit, I'm a minority. I need to change the way I act and operate if I'm going to be on the inside and I'm going to have an impact. And so a lot of people say you sell out, you know, you're not being who you are. And it's like, okay, better to be like them and, and in the game than sitting on the bench. What, what did you do to be like them? <laughs> well, the first thing I did is I started swearing a lot. <laughs> <laughs> a lot. And I'm not kidding. I was, uh, the worst experience, I was a junior engineer sitting in a conference room with all men, all, all white men, older men, and they're, you know, talking rough and tumble, and this one guy throws out the F word and then stops and turns to me, so all eyes on me, 23 years old, and says, oh, I'm sorry. And I said, no effing problem. <laughs> And then I like literally just, just would throw out the F word every now and then, just randomly. And, um, <laughs> so, and it was hard, actually. I had to concentrate, like, swear now, now, swear now. <laughs> it, was, it was really hard. So, um, so I did that, and then I learned to drink scotch. Neat, right? Neat. You have to drink it neat. And then I uh, got a stick shift BMW, because engineers like BMWs, and no one drives an automatic. <laughs> So I got a stick, and yeah, I, I mean, I tried to play the, Good for play you. the game. I, I didn't do the bad haircut, the $10 engineering haircut. I wouldn't go that far. That's where, <laughs> where I drew the line, but otherwise. And then there was a point, but, Diane, I oh. think, when you, <clears throat> when you were encouraged by a boss to take another track out of sort of the engineering route, and you yeah. chose to stay yeah. in your, in, in, on your engineering yeah, path. How did you hear that story? Yeah, so our, our CEO said, um, <clears throat> so I started, CEO was this? At, at the time it was Paul Odellini. Uh-huh. Yeah, so we were, um, so I stayed in engineering for, um, as a direct contributor, as an individual contributor, so I like, grew a nice foundation of true engineering knowledge, right, technical knowledge. And I think that was the first thing that was incredibly critical, because as a woman, Everybody wants you to manage, you know, oh, you got such good teamwork, collaboration, good communicator, you know, manage a team. I was like, no, I went to engineering school, I'm going to be an engineer. And that's why I threw out the other hand. <laughs> and so that was the first decision. And I got me, pa I have patents and published papers. And so I feel like, okay, I've, I've got some foundation under me, right? I earned this. And then I stayed in engineering, started managing larger and larger engineering teams, microprocessor design at Intel. And Odellini was the one that said to me, you know, damn it, Diane, you got to get out of engineering and get over to marketing or sales if you want to be a general manager. And um, I, at the time, I saw I still have two children. I was going to say at the time I had two children. I still have two <laughs> children. <laughs> They're just a lot older now. Um, they're in high school and college now, but I had two kids and, and sales and marketing is a lot of travel, right? It's a lot of travel. And I thought there's just no way I can pull that off, but I, I can't admit that I have two kids and hence I'm passing up an opportunity. So I said, no, you know, I'm going to stay in technology, stay on the tech side, uh, dig in. And it, it, and so I didn't move into sales and marketing. I didn't do a stint. And so when the next general manager position came up, um, I got the well, you don't have sales and marketing expertise, so you have to be two in a box with someone who does. And so I, I certainly negatively impacted my, my career pace up the ranks into general management and vice president um, by not going that route. Um, but in the end, it worked out. It's fine. worked out. Are, my kids are fine, yeah. <laughs> so Diane runs <clears throat> the 18 billion, that, or that was the revenue last year, 18 billion data services division. And Intel reported earnings yesterday. Uh, you had record revenue, record profits as right. well. Uh, fastest growing division, most profitable division at Intel. And the reason that it's growing so rapidly and it is so profitable is Intel is making this massive shift from chips for, per, for PCs to chips for yep. cloud computing. And Diane, we're going to move to questions in a minute, but briefly, what is the opportunity as cloud computing, the Internet of Things, becomes your business? How will you change the world? Well, you know, I think that is the exciting, that is the exciting part. So I have been in the server, infrastructure, server storage network side of Intel for 18 years. I've been in Intel for 31. But for the last 18 years, it's like finally servers are sexy. Like now, finally, we're talking about the cloud, right? It's it's fun, and and 
the move to cloud computing as this big architectural change in the way technology is delivered has been transformative. It has increased the reach of technology, increased the number of services. I mean, you look at Google and YouTube and Facebook, I thought it was, it was a staggering stack that, stat that Susan said 400 million hours of video uploaded on YouTube every minute, I and mean, that's thanks to cloud computing where you have this, this massive elasticity of uh, technology. And it does, it unleashes um, tremendous, tremendous opportunities. It's what's you know, fueling the growth of, of my business and the growth of Intel. And 75% now of Intel's growth is coming out of the data center business. And so much of, you know, you have probably a bigger ability, opportunity to impact the world now than ever. I mean, I know your mother died of, at 50, age 54 of cancer and you're working on all sorts yeah. of health, you know. Yeah. Well, that's, so the, the neat thing about cloud computing is it enables more things and devices to attach at lower cost, more efficiently, easier, all that jazz. And so with that, then you get massive amounts of data. And data has been the buzzword in, at this event. It's been the buzzword in the industry. It, it is the big buzz. Data is the currency of the digital economy. And with that data, you can do magical things. And one of them is data applied to the healthcare industry. And so what we're what we did in, um, in my group, one of our efforts around um, artificial intelligence and the use of data for good, we talk about AI for good, um, is applying uh, analytics to healthcare. So we, um, we started an initiative two years ago called All in One Day by 2020. And in partnering with the major cancer institutes around the world, in 2020, if you have cancer, you'll be able to walk into your doctor's office, you will have your full genome sequenced, your tumor will be compared across the genome sequences around the world, all the millions and millions and billions of sequences around the world. A match will be identified between your tumor and all the other people in the world that have had that same cancer. The treatment for those folks and whether they survive or not will be determined. And from that, your personalized treatment for your cancer will be delivered to you. All of that in one day. And all in one day. And we have time for possible. one question, and it's unfortunately. This oh, is I'm sorry. Fantastic. Hey, do not apologize. Your story We're is solving cancer. Yeah. very inspiring in so many ways. Maybe we don't. Uh, do, we have, do we have any questions? No? Do I, I, I will say your, to your point, um, my mom, I'm 54 <laughs> now, and it's not as oh, awesome boy. Me that my mom died at 54. And, and um, half of all men and a third of all women will have cancer um, in their life, which is a staggering number. And you think about data and technology applied to the healthcare industry, it has been so long coming. It is, healthcare industry is the last to embrace and adopt technology. And as someone said yesterday, uh, President Obama has been just at the forefront of grabbing technology and applying it to, to real problems. And certainly the healthcare industry is one of them. Education, applying um, big data analytics to education to get personalized learning, applying data analytics to farming to get precision, um, precision farming, drive up the yields. Um, there's just so many opportunities now, and it's, it's, uh, it's pretty exciting. Fantastic. Yeah. What's the best advice you ever got? Oh, um, best advice I ever got is um, be confident. So uh, confidence, we know, uh, is more highly correlated to success than competence. <laughs> There's lots of research to show that. And um, I think our, my male counterparts um, have learned more quickly than my um, female counterparts that Conveying confidence is critical. I mean, I, I, I always get this like, why are men so confident? It's like they're not confident. Inside, they're just as concerned as you are, but they've learned to convey confidence at all times because no one wants a leader that's walking around going, holy cow, we're doomed, we're all gonna fail, right? It's like, no, <laughs> like, like who's gonna rally to be in that group, right? You need to walk around going, damn it, we're gonna win. I'm, we're confident, we've got a path, we've got a vision. At all times, convey confidence. <laughs> Diane, you are inspiring. Thank you, Thank you so much.